kindness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. All right, verse number six is going to be where we're going to focus on tonight. It says, and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience. We're going to talk to you tonight about this topic. These things, part number six, to temperance patience. To temperance patience. Let's pray. Father. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Jesus, and I'm so grateful for all that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Bless us now. Holy Spirit, give me your power. I also need the mind of Christ as I preach. I pray for every single person here and those watching online that you'll give us ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. If there's something that needs to be addressed in our lives, Lord, please help us to be aware of it and to be attentive to the Holy Spirit of God. I pray for anybody under the sound of my voice that needs to be saved. I pray they'll get saved tonight. I pray, Lord, for tomorrow. Lord, please help us to have over 150. Help us to have many visitors, salvations, baptisms, a great offering, a great spirit. And we'll give you all the glory for what you'll do this weekend. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Two temperance patience once again we've been discussing now all these weeks this is part number six about how to to live a christian life and never fall never fall into sin never fall out of the will of god never fall into a snare and trap of the devil there are seven things that are mentioned in second Tim, second peter chapter one and so far we have discussed virtue knowledge and temperance tonight we're going to discuss the fourth of these things god says if you have these things in your christian life you will never fall i mean this this is incredible i mean it really really is i hope everybody here understands the gravity of the fact that these things are crucial in your life as a christian so that you'll never fall unless you just want to maybe be like the average christian and fall you know hopefully nobody here wants to be that way right brother nick nobody wants to be that way and so the fact of the matter is though if you have these seven things in your life you'll never fall now tonight is the fourth of these seven things it's called patience add to temperance patience now again we've got to add these in order you have the foundation of faith that is complete reliance upon christ for salvation and a life lived on the word of god in other words every single part of the word of god establishes your faith and practice through how you live when you have the foundation of faith then god says add to that faith virtue that's moral excellence we talked about that add to virtue knowledge knowledge is a clear and certain perception of truth reality and that which exists and then from knowledge you add temperance temperance is self-control while being led of the spirit that's what temperance is now tonight we're going to talk about patience i'm going to give you eight thoughts eight points if you'd like to take notes please get out your pens and papers and let's get this going now number one write this down patience is cheerful endurance it also is to stay under cheerful endurance to stay under to bear to have fortitude and then lastly, a steadfast waiting for, all right? So patience is a cheerful endurance. It means to stay under. It means to bear. It means to have fortitude. And it means a steadfast waiting for. Now, we're going to talk about different definitions of the, of the word patience throughout the course tonight. But I'd like you to understand patience is cheerful endurance, that's the first thing I want you to understand. Uh, you, you do not have patience if, you, if you're depressed while you're waiting, if you're angry while you're re waiting, if you're doubting while you're waiting. That's not patience. Patience is a cheerful endurance, all right? So it's, it's, ha it's not like, oh, brother, I got to wait. See, when's this ever going to happen? Well, that's not patience. That's, uh, that's complaining, maybe, or uh, it's griping, maybe, or uh, maybe it's, it's, it's irritable, like you're irritable. No, 
Patience is a cheerful endurance. So you have the right attitude. You're smiling while you're enduring. It also means to have a steadfast waiting for. So while you're waiting for something, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, different things that you could be waiting for. While you're waiting for something, you're steadfast in your faith. You're steadfast in your Christianity. You're steadfast in your faithfulness to church. You're steadfast in your obedience to the word of God. That's all what patience is about. So, number one, patience, you need it if you're never going to fall. Patience is a cheerful endurance to stay under, to bear, to have fortitude, and a steadfast waiting for. Number two, go to Psalms 37. The book of Psalms in the Old Testament, chapter number 37, please. Psalms 37, and look down at verse number seven, Psalms 37. 37 and verse number seven you still glad to be here tonight all right amen glad you all are here psalm 37 and look down at verse number seven please psalm 37 and verse number seven psalms 37 and verse number seven i love this verse i love in fact i love psalm 37 it's a great chapter to read if you ever need some encouragement if you ever need some hope and um an inspiration from the word of god Psalm 37 is a great chapter to read. But look what it says in verse number 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Okay? It says there, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Number 2, write this down. All right? Learn to wait patiently for the Lord to work. Learn to wait patiently for the Lord to work. I've had to learn this over the years, 28 years of pastoring this church. I always want God to answer my prayer yesterday. I always want goals to be hit immediately. I always want um, um, things to happen, just you know, snap of the finger when it comes to the things of God. I remember in, in hiring staff members, like right now we're uh, looking to hire um, a Spanish pastor because Brother, Brother uh, Aguilar and his family um, have moved to Indiana. They moved uh, February 1st, I believe it was. And um, if I, it wasn't February 1st or March 1st. I, March 1st? I can't remember. It's all a blur. Here it is May. All right. So I, I've been reaching out, trying to have contacts for possible Spanish pastors to fill in, you know, the need that we have here. And I've had some names given to me. Um, I had an interview of someone in Mexico, and, uh, but there's some complications there. I'm not sure if it's going to work out, all uh, surrounding the religious visa and things like that. Um, I'm waiting to see if it's something attainable that we, can, that we can work with. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we have David Zarazola, who's been a, a pastor, friend of ours from Commerce City. He pastors the Spanish church in Commerce City, and uh, he's been filling in for us, but it's not permanent. It's just temporary. He says, I'll fill in for you until you're able to hire a new Spanish pastor, which is awesome, and I appreciate him doing that. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's now been all of, all of March, all of April, and we're getting close, you know, halfway through May, and we still haven't had a Spanish pastor yet agree to come work for us. Now, I've got to patiently wait for the Lord to work. I remember one year when we were looking for a youth pastor to, to come in, it took a year and a half to find our next youth pastor. And you just, you've got to be patient. I remember that, that time period when I was looking for uh, a new youth pastor. I think I interviewed between 20 and 25 prospective staff members. And, it, you know, it just took time. So I've learned over the years that when God is working, I need to wait patiently for the Lord. Now, what's God doing in your life? What are you asking God to help you with in your life as far as wisdom, as far as direction, as far as maybe ministry, maybe your family, whatever the need may be? Listen carefully. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. It says there in the next phrase, fret not thyself. In other words, don't get agitated. Don't get irritated. Don't get, oh man, look at all these other people prospering. Look at all these other people being a success. Look at <coughs> all this other thing. And here I am waiting week after week, month after month, year after year. No, don't fret. Don't fret. Don't fret. We have learned throughout the years, God's timing is always best. God knows best. Now, we're, we're, we don't see the big picture. You know, what we see is the now. What we see is Saturday, May 14th, 
2022, we've got this need and that need, and we need God to work here, and we need God to work there. We like our church to grow, and et cetera. We got financial pressures and needs. We've got workers. We need workers. <clears throat> I need to hire staff, you know, and it's like, come on, let's get going. The truth of the matter is, I, I'm, I'm not naturally gifted to patience. I'd like things just to move right along, just move right along. I'm running a 100-yard dash. I'm trying to get from point A to point B as fast as I possibly can. I mean, that's my nature, and that's what I desire. But I have learned over the years to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Can I give you an example of waiting patiently for the Lord to work? Let me give you an example. You listening? Jesus up in heaven is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he is wanting to come back and call his children home. That's the rapture. He wants to do it. And he said, I don't know the day. I do not know the hour. The Father knows. He says, I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father. And as soon as my Father says, go get your children, I'm gone. I'm going to go get them. The rapture is going to take place. But here's Jesus for 2,000 years. Since he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's basically every day, Father, is it today? Is today the day? And he's been patient. Now, he's waiting for the Father to say, now's the time, son. Go get your children. Now, he's been waiting for 2,000 years. We've been waiting the whole time that we've been alive, the whole time that we've been saved, and we've learned that the Lord is coming back. We have been patient, saying, Lord, even so come, Lord Jesus. In fact, uh, John the Apostle that wrote uh, Revelation, the, the second to the last verse in the Bible, the second to the last verse, Revelation 22 and verse 20, John the Apostle wrote, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So when John the Apostle, approximately 90 AD, is when the book of Revelation was written. And, and so as he wrote the book, he was wrapping up the Bible. And he said, man, the Lord's coming back. Quickly, he said. And here's what John the Apostle said. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. John the Apostle thought Jesus was going to return in his lifetime. That was approximately 90 A.D., which is just under 2,000 years ago, you know, um, uh, uh, 1,952 years ago. And, uh, the, or, let's see, 1,932 years ago, I think is what it is now. Uh, but at any rate, 90 A.D., he thought, man, the Lord could come now, right? And he said, come quickly, Lord, come, even so. So there's patience in waiting on the Lord. You've got to have patience. Sometimes people are impatient. They jump, they jump the gun. You know, they, they make a decision that affects the rest of their life. And they do it impatiently. And most of the time, it just doesn't happen well. It doesn't work out well. I, I've seen people in 28 years of pastoring, you know, they, they just make a snap decision like that. Some, they're, they're irritated, they're agitated, maybe they're angry. And they've been, maybe they've been praying about making a decision, whatever the case may be. Sometimes they haven't been prayed, prayed at all. You know, something happens and just make a snap decision. It affects the whole rest of their lives. It's amazing to me how I've, I've observed human nature in the 28 years I've been here, how many times people make snap decisions that are literally life-altering decisions for themselves and for their families. It's amazing. We need some patience. We need to allow God to work out whatever needs to work out. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the biggest traps or the ploys of the devil is your impatience to make a decision rationally and on the spur of the moment, especially things that are, that, that are very, very important, you know? Well, I'll just do this. What, what, what do you mean you'll just do this? Have you thought it through? It's going to affect everything. It's going to affect your job, your career. It's going to affect your church. It's going to affect your school for your, your children, maybe, if you have children. Um, it's going to affect your possible marriage in the future. You know, uh, uh, there's been a few people that have gotten married over the years, and uh, they met here at this church. Can you imagine if they would have quit the church before they met the person that they were going to marry? 
Can you imagine they would have never gotten married? I mean, I look back in my life, you know, where, okay, um, I went to a Bible college in Watertown, Wisconsin, my first year of Bible college. And during that whole year, I felt bothered. Are you listening? I'm giving you an illustration. I'm giving you an example. I, I felt bothered because they weren't right on the King James Bible. They weren't right on the local church. They weren't right on, on soul winning. And it was just, it, I could just feel that, man, this, this may not be where I, I'm supposed to be. So I, all summer long, June, July, and August, in between my freshman year of Bible college and my second year, I felt like I needed to transfer to Hiles Anderson College. And I prayed about it all summer long. And, and, and I, first in June, I said, yes, I'm going to go. And then I talked to my, my, uh, uh, someone who tried to give me advice and said, God doesn't run us around in circles. You know, he wants you to finish where you start. Go, go back to the college in Wisconsin. I thought, well, that sounded like good advice. Okay, I'm going to stay. I'm not going to quit. Because I don't want to be a quitter. I've, I've never been a quitter. I don't want to be a quitter. I hate quitting. I hate it. And I felt like, you know, I just need to stick it out and learn what I need to learn. And all summer long, I wrestled with it and wrestled with it. I'd go back and forth, back and forth. And then I finally, in August, at the end of August, right before school, the school year was going to begin, I met with my pastor, and here's what he said. Here's my advice to you, Corey. I'm sorry, Pastor Sulian. <laughs> he goes, I, uh, you need to transfer to Hiles Anderson. He says, for just one semester, just one semester. If God doesn't want you there, he'll let you know. You can transfer back to the college that you're at. He said that the, the credits will transfer probably that, you know, or if not all of them, most of them. And you'll be right on course to graduate in four years. He's, here's what he said. If you never go to Hiles Anderson for just one semester, he said, you'll, you'll always wonder the rest of your life, should I have been at Hiles Anderson? He says, you've got to go to, to determine that. And that was in August, and, and literally the week before school started, I finally decided, okay, I'm going to transfer to Hiles Anderson. Now, I did not make that decision on the snap of a, you know, just like that. It was literally all summer, June, July, and August. I was waiting patiently for the Lord to direct me, and you know what? He did. I transferred to Hiles Anderson. If I had not done that, I would have never married my wife. I would have never came to Longmont, Colorado. The reason I came to Longmont, Colorado is because it was the advice of Dr. Jack Hiles. I would have never, he would have never been my pastor if I wouldn't have transferred. I mean, everything would have been altered way differently the rest of my life. And that was a huge decision that I had to make. And I took three months. I got advice. I prayed. I, I, I waited. Are you listening? I waited patiently for the Lord. I waited for him, and you know what? He directed me, and I'm so glad I did. Number one, patience is a cheerful endurance to stay under, to bear, to have fortitude, a steadfast waiting for. Number two, learn to wait patiently for the Lord to work. Number three, go to Luke chapter number eight. Luke chapter number eight. Luke chapter number eight, please. And look down, if you would, please, at verse number 11. Luke chapter number eight. And verse number 11. Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 11. We're going to read down to verse 15. Luke chapter 8 verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of the, their hearts. Lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But, verse 15, that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with Patience. Number three, write this down if you're taking notes. When producing fruit for the Lord, you need patience. When producing fruit for the Lord, you need patience. You know what? In the kingdom of God, there are two main fruits that we're supposed to try to produce. Soul saved, lives changed. Now listen, it takes patience. I mean, it just does. You know, seeing someone saved most of the time, can happen quicker 
than seeing a life changed. Like today, for example, um, I met two, I, I, I met four people. And right the first day I met them, I asked them if I could share with them from the Bible how to be saved. They said yes. All four of them prayed and received Christ as their Savior. Now, all four of them promised to come to church tomorrow with their families. Now, they may or may not, right? A lot of times people promise to come and they don't. I'm hoping that they'll come. I really am. But anything that history has taught me in 28 years of pastoring, a lot of people promise and they don't follow through. But it just takes time. I mean, it just takes time. I remember um, a couple of examples. The Huerta family, when I first met them, I, it was their children, Tanya and um, her older brothers, Christian and Fernando. We had started a bus route in, um, let's see here, uh, Easter Sunday, 1997. That was the first time that, that we ran a bus. And they were on the bus. They came that first Sunday. Over the years, their mom and dad started coming. And now they are solid, faithful members of our church, participating, giving, um, you know, working in, in whatever capacity they can work in. And, uh, but it, it, it took years for Brother Miguel and Brother Adela to actually get to the point where they were going to be faithful and solid and contributing and workers. I, I think of, of, of Bill and Jordan. I, I, think, I think, Jordan, I think you might have came in 1997 for the first time, if I remember correctly. And uh, her dad said, I'm going to come check this church out if my daughter's going to ride the bus. And so he did. But he didn't start coming faithfully right off the bat. It took several years. He would come on Sunday morning only. And then in time, a period of time, he started coming back on Sunday nights. Then a period of time, he started coming on Wednesday nights. I remember, I think, the first Super Bowl that the Broncos were in. And um, they played the, 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 the Packers. 1998, I believe it was, and, um, and, and brother, brother Bill stayed home uh, to watch the football game on Sunday night, and he said, I felt so bad about that. It was either 98 or 99, one or the other, and uh, anyway, he said, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to miss a church service because of a football game, right, and, and it just took time to grow, and then he was driving a bus, and then, of course, all these years now, he's been faithful, and Jordan's been faithful, and going to college, graduating, come back on staff. Well, it just, it just takes time for things to develop, and and here's the thing if you're going to see fruit in the lord you've got to be patient you've got to be patient if i was impatient can you imagine if i would have said to bill listen man if you're not going to start coming faithfully just just stop coming if i would have said to the where family hey listen what in the world i mean how many years is it going to take for you to get with it you know just decide or leave right if i would have been impatient they would have never grown. And then I could give other families and illustrations, right, about patience. Now, listen, if you engage in ministry work for the Lord and you want to see fruit, soul saved and lives changed, you're going to ex have to exhibit patience. It's going to take time. I've seen people over the years who they start soul winning, right? And, and they go out week after week after week and they don't see anybody saved. So then they just give up and quit. I guess I'm just not cut out to be a soul winner. Um, maybe they go and they see people saved, but then they never come to church, right? Then, then they're like, well, I guess, I guess I just can't get people to church. So I guess I'm just going to stop. Then, you know what I've seen happen before? I've seen, you know, people work hard to get a visitor to come to church. And they finally do. And then they get offended. The visitor gets offended at something I say in the sermon. And they don't come back. And then I've seen this happen. Church members go, well, psh, if I'm going to bring visitors to church and they're just going to get offended, then I'm just not going to bring visitors anymore. And then they just stop. And you know what the whole secret is? The whole problem? They're impatient. And they need to be patient to see fruit, to see people come, to see souls saved, to see lives change. You need to have patience. I don't know about you, but I love the kingdom of God. I want to see souls saved. I want to see lives changed. I'm going to have to be patient. You know, everybody we meet is not a, a Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle got saved and dedicated the very same day. Man, he took off for the Lord. He started growing in the Lord right off the bat, became useful, all of that. We want those Paul the Apostle experiences. We want our converts to be like Paul the Apostle. But, but it's very, 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 very rare. I mean, very, very, very rare. We've got to have patience. It is so easy for us just to throw in the towel. You know, I think of a missionary named um, 
Adnarm Judson, if I remember correctly. I think that's how you pronounce his first name. He went to Burma. And for seven years, he didn't have a single convert. For seven years, he tried to see people saved and translate the Bible in the Burmese language and tried to establish churches. And he went through trials and tribulations. And oh, my soul. He felt like he was a failure seven years before he had his first convert. You know, since he's gone and to be with the Lord, he's you know, passed away. This is many, many years ago. And there are literally hundreds of churches in Burma, in that country, all because of what he did to lay the found work. And it just took patience. It just took years. I know that um, um, I was talking to a preacher, Bob Bowen. He's going to be coming and preaching for us this year for our missions conference. I'm looking forward to having Brother Bowen. He's our missionary to Thailand and uh, one of our missionaries to Thailand. But he told me, he said, look, did you know? He said, Pastor Sulian, he said, did you know that most preachers, their ministries did not blossom and start really growing until after year 60. He said most of them in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, they, they, they were pastoring, they had good solid works, but they didn't explode until after they were 60. Some of them, they didn't start really growing until after they were 70. And then he said, what, what do you think would have happened if they would have gotten discouraged at age 50 and said, you know what, I guess I'm just not going to be a good pastor or not going to be able to build a, build, build a great work for God, so I might as well just quit. It would have never come to fruition. There's only one person that he studied in all those studies of preachers that was the exception to the rule. And you know who it was? It was Jack Hiles, man. He started growing in his 20s. He had the fastest growing church in America in his 20s. Now, not everybody can be a Jack Hiles. He said, but he named all these preachers, Tom Malone, Lee Robertson, you know, all these great preachers in the past. They did not start exploding in their growth until after they turned 60 or after they turned 70. They had to have patience when it comes to the work of the Lord. When producing fruit for the Lord, you need patience. Number four, look at Romans chapter two. Quickly now, Romans chapter number two. Y'all still awake? How many of you need an espresso shot of coffee right now? Raise your hand. All right, there you go. I see you. I see you. Please, uh, in your mind, in your mind, you've got to say, I'm going to stay, I'm going to uh, pay attention on purpose. If you don't, you're not going to, you're going to miss so much truth. If you're sleeping or daydreaming or talking or distracted or looking at your phone, you're going to miss so much truth. You've got it in your mind. You've got to say, I'm going to make myself pay attention to the sermon. All right, look at Romans chapter two. Look at verse number six. Romans chapter 2, verse number 6. We're going to read down to verse 11. Romans 2, verse number 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. For there is no respect of persons with God. All right. In verse 7, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing. All right. Number four, write this down. Patiently continue in well-doing doing that's what you got to do are you listening patiently continue in well-doing patiently continue in well-doing just keep reading your bible just keep praying just keep coming to church just keep tithing just keep doing well and be patient god says in due season you'll reap if you faint not just be patient in the continuing of well-doing you've got to do that you've got to do that I know what we we do we, we plant and, and we want the crop to come up the next day and spiritually speaking it's just not that case you've got to be patient in the continuing of well-doing when we get in trouble here's what we do we start to come to church and then we stop then we start again then we stop then we start again then we stop we uh, start to tithe and we and we tithe and tithe and then we get discouraged or have some bills and we stop and then we pick it up again six months later and start again and, and it's that intermediate it's that hit and miss it's that unfaithfulness it's that well i'm not continuing patiently i, I start and then stop and then I start and then stop okay how about addictions 
You want to overcome cigarettes? You want to overcome tobacco? You want to overcome alcohol? You want to overcome drugs? You want to overcome internet pornography? Whatever it is, you've got to continue patiently, continue in well-doing. What you do is you say, today, I'm not going to succumb to my temptation. And then you go through the whole day and you don't succumb. And then you wake up the next day and you're like, okay, today, I'm just focused on today. Not 20 years from now. I'm just focused on today. When the temptation comes, I'm going to resist it. I'm going to say no to it. I'm going to do something else instead, like read my Bible or pray or um, uh, uh, do a different activity to distract my mind from the temptation. And patiently continue day after day, week after week, year after year. And then once you do that, you'll look back at the end of your life and you'll say, wow, look at that life I've got to live for God. It takes patience, continue in well-doing. Patiently continue in well-doing. Listen, you will never succeed when you decide not to do right. You'll never succeed. You will always succeed if you keep doing what God says is right to do. You just keep doing it. Patiently continue. Don't get irritated. Don't get frustrated. Don't say, well, I'm just not going to go soul winning today. I'm just fed up. Well, you know, that, that may be the day that person that you could have led to Christ. That may have been their opportunity, their day of visitation. And now you're going to miss it because you, you got frustrated. You didn't patiently continue. You know, when it comes to giving, I know some people struggle with giving, and the problem is patience. It really is. You've got to keep doing it and just let God open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive it in his time, in his time. I've told the old story before. People who start tithing, here's what they do. They tithe on Sunday. They go to the mailbox on Monday, and they say, where's my blessing? Where's it at? I, where's that check? Where's that unexpected blessing? It doesn't work like that. You've got to have patience in continuing in well-doing. And then in due season, you'll reap. Number five, look at Romans chapter five now. You're in Romans two. Let's turn to just a couple of pages over. Romans chapter number five. Look down, if you would, please, at verse number three. Romans chapter five, and look at verse three. It says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not a shame because the love of god is shed abroad in our hearts by the holy ghost which is given unto us number uh five write this down ready you gain patience by going through tribulations oh boy oh boy you number five you gain patience by going through tribulations you look what it says there in verse number number uh three knowing that tribulation worketh patience and then in verse four and patience experience and experience hope all right how am i going to gain patience in my life through tribulation have you ever heard someone say i need patience but i'm, I'm afraid to pray for it you ever heard someone say that have you ever said that when you pray for God to give you patience, do you know how he gives you patience? He gives you a tribulation. Tribulation is going to teach you patience. If you, don't want, if you don't want tribulation, you're never going to get patience. You do not get patience by going to the store and finding patience on the shelf and then buying it and saying, I think I'll buy some patience. No. You get patience through tribulation. Let's, let me give you one more passage that kind of explains that. Look at James chapter 1. Turn to James, right after the book of Hebrews, James chapter 1. And this is the same thought. Uh, it's a similar passage, but I want you to see it. James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Now watch this. James chapter number 1 and verses 3 and 4. Look what it says. James Chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So we've learned how does patience come? Through tribulations and through trials. The trying of your faith worketh patience, 
And then God says, let patience have her perfect work. Let it work out. Let patience come through the trial. Why? Because that's how you're going to get it. Patience, you gain patience by going through tribulations and trials. That's how it happens. I wish there was a different way. I wish you could read a book and say, oh, that's how you get patience. All right, I got it. I got it. I wish you could just listen to a sermon and say, you know what? I learned about patience tonight. I've got it. I got it down. No, you don't. You're learning about patience tonight. And what you're learning, point number five is, if you gain patience, it's going to be through tribulations and through trials. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's suppose you want to physically get fit, right? You go down to some weights. Let's say you're going you're gonna to do some, um, but you're laying on a bench in your, what's it called? Bench presses. Thank you. I lost it there for a second in my mind. So let's suppose you say, hey, I think I'm going to bench press 300 pounds. I'm just going to do it, man, just like that. First day, I go down there, and I'm going to, I did it. Okay, great, I did it. No, 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 no. If you've never bench pressed 300 pounds before, you're not just going to go down to the bench press and just do it just like that. You know what's going to happen? You're going to have to start out at maybe 150 pounds. And then you're going to have to work on that for a week or so. And then go up to 160 pounds and, you know, a little bit at a time. And while you're working out, you, what you're doing is you're pushing your muscles to their limit. And when you push them to the limit, you're stretching them, tearing them. And then you've got to wait a couple of days or so for them to heal. And then when they heal, they're going to be stronger for it. And you've got to take weeks and months to go from bench pressing 150 pounds to successfully bench pressing 300 pounds. The whole time you're doing that, you're putting your muscles through trial. That's what you're doing. At the end of all that period of time, whatever it is, six months, let's say, now you're able to bench press 300 pounds. Patience is kind of like that. You don't just wake up and say, okay, I think I'm going to be patient. I've got it down. No, you've got to go through trials. You've got to go through tribulations. That's how patience comes to us. That's how you learn patience. And you've got to let patience have her perfect work. You've got to let it be complete. And you can't cut it off short. Okay, I'm done with the trial. I'm not doing this anymore. Can you imagine if you're bench pressing 150 pounds and you get up to 250 and you're bench pressing 250 and your goal is 300 and you say, that's it, I'm done. I'm tired of going through this uh, uh, workout. I'm tired of straining my muscles. I'm tired of it all. I'm done right now. Well, guess what? Then you patiently got to the point of 250 pounds, but you didn't hit the goal of 300 pounds. And what happens is God says, let patience have her perfect work. Let the trials continue for as long as they need in order for you to gain patience. So I said, number five, you gain patience by going through tribulations and trials. Number six, look at Colossians chapter one. Turn back to the book of Colossians now, just a few books to the left. Colossians chapter number one. Colossians chapter number one, and we're going to read verses 10 and 11. Colossians chapter number one, verses 10 and 11. Look what it says now. Colossians chapter one, verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. All of that's wonderful. I, I walk worthy, all pleasing, being fruitful, increasing in knowledge. Here's how it happens. Look at verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. All right, number six, write this down. People who learn patience also retain joy. People who learn patience, they also retain joy. Look what it says in verse 11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto, look what it says, all patience and long suffering. Here's what it says, with joyfulness. You know, the most joyful Christians I know are the ones who have learned patience. 
The Christians that are impatient in life, they're not always very joyful. You ever find yourself agitated, angry? You ever find yourself depressed? You ever find yourself easily ticked off? Not joyful? Patience is the key. When you learn patience, guess what? You can be going through a storm, and when you have patience, guess what you also get with it? Joy. You have a smile on your face. Remember, remember what? The very beginning, point number one. Remember what I told you patience was? Cheerful endurance. That word cheerful is synonymous with the word joy. It's patiently enduring with a smile on your face. People who learn patience also retain joy. You see, you can get joy for a moment. You can have pleasure for a moment. You could be like, yay, we had a great service. And then all of a sudden, Monday, you go through a trial, and then boom, you're right back, crash down to earth. No more, no more joy. You have depression. You have anger. You're agitated. You, um, you're depressed, whatever, right? Because you don't have patience. But when you, when you learn patience, joy gets retained because you've learned to be patient. All these things that we're talking about, joy can still be in your life, even though you're going through tribulations and trials to learn joy. When you learn patience, joy is not fleeting. It's not just temporary. It's not just for that moment. It continues throughout your life. You have joy after joy after joy. It just goes day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. You're a joyful person. Why? Because you've learned patience. Because you've learned patience. P people who learn patience also retain joy. Listen, you want to be a joyful Christian the rest of your life? Learn patience. Learn patience. That'll help you to retain joy. Number seven, we only got eight points. We're almost done. Look at Hebrews chapter six. You're in Colossians right now. Turn to the right. Just a few handful of books. Hebrews chapter six. We're going to look at two chapters in Hebrews. We're going to look at chapter six and chapter 10 right now for point number seven. Hebrews Chapter number 6, look at verse 11 and 12 and 15. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 and 15. Verse 11, it says this, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, that's lazy, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Look at verse 15. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Go to chapter 10. Chapter 10 and verse number 36. Chapter 10 of Hebrews and verse number 36. Chapter 10, verse 36. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Number seven, write this down. Patience is needed if you wish to inherit the promises of God. Patience is needed if you wish to inherit the promises of God. Listen to me very carefully right now. Once you do the will of God, the condition of what the promise is, here's what God says. After you have done the will of God, you need patience that you might receive the promise. So here's what it is. Here's the condition, the will of God. You meet that condition, you do it. Excuse me. You meet the condition of the will of God. And now the promise of God is supposed to come through. Here's what God says. You need patience. You need patience. You know what the Bible teaches? God will never lie. So if there's a promise and you meet the condition... God will never lie. He will come through, but he'll come through in his time. You need patience. After that, you've done the will of God, that you might receive the promise or the inheritance, uh, especially when it comes to heaven. You know what God says? Once you obtain a crown, he says, be careful. Let no man take thy crown. So once you've earned a crown between now and the day you die and go to heaven and receive your inheritance, you could lose it. You could let someone take it from you if you're impatient, if you're not patient. 
Patience is needed if you wish to inherit the promises of God. One preacher worded it this way years ago. He said, God will be a debtor to no man. You know what that means? He'll never say, oh, yeah, I owe you one of these days. You know, I owe you. I'm in debt to you. No, no. He'll never be a debtor to us. He will always keep his word. He will always keep his promises. But it's just going to be in his timing. And that's what patience will help you to do. It'll help you to inherit the promises. Now, last verse, look at Hebrews 12. Two chapters over to the right, maybe just one page in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 12, very familiar verses, verses 1, 2, and 3. Look what it says. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that's all the loved ones and friends and the saints who have gone on before, they're in the cloud of witnesses, they're watching us. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us, look what it says, run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith you know when you're running a race aren't you looking at the finish line when you're running a race jesus is the author and finisher he's the finisher of our faith so that's what you're, you're looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith now watch this who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Number eight and last, write this down if you're taking notes. Number eight, run your race in life with patience. Run your race, number eight, run your race in life with patience. In verse number one, it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, considering him, lest we be wearied and faint in our minds. So listen to this statement. Under point number eight, I wrote this down. Continuing the race all the way to the end is more important than any accomplishment in the present. Let that sink in. Think about that. Continuing the race all the way to the end is more important than any accomplishment in the present. Let me give you an example. I'm going to give you a sports analogy. I have seen so many sporting events in my lifetime. I've seen too many. One is a common, common trend. A team, a football team, will be in the lead for 59 and a half minutes of a 60-minute football game. Well, they start out 0-0, right, and they score first. And then, then they keep scoring, the other team scores, but they're always in the lead. They're ahead by one point. 59 and a half minutes of the game. They have been either tied or in the lead the entire time. They have never been behind. And then on the last play of the game, the other team kicks a winning field goal and they win the game by like two, by two points. They had the lead for seconds, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, 10 seconds, whatever it was, they had the lead. The other team, they had the lead the entire game all the way up until the end and they lost the game. Now watch this carefully. It doesn't matter that they had a great touchdown pass during the game. It doesn't matter that they had a huge defensive interception during the game. It doesn't matter that they had a rushing touchdown during the game. What happens is when the clock struck zero, they lost. All the accomplishments during the game didn't matter a hill of beans. They lost the game. When it comes to sports, listen to the statement, all that matters is winning when it comes to sports. I'm, I'm just telling you about, you know, just reality. All that matters is winning. I, I have said to you for years, great, great athletes, I mean Hall of Fame caliber athletes, they hate losing more than they love winning. 
And my wife heard that on the radio for the first time. I don't know if it's the first time. But she heard it on the radio. She goes, hey, I just heard a coach that said greatness or people that really succeed in life, they hate losing more than they love winning. And, uh, and she goes, you say that. I'm like, yeah, that's true. That's, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't come up with it. I heard, a, I heard a coach say it one time. And I learned it. It's stuck in my head. Listen, listen. If you want to be a champion, you can't just say, well, we did our best. Well, we had some good plays, but we lost. You got to hate losing. You got to look at that and say, I don't want to lose. And if you don't want to lose in the race of life, it doesn't matter what you accomplish today. What matters is that you, you run with patience. The race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, considering him, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. What matters most is that you run the race all the way until the end. Not what you accomplish today. Hey, I led four souls to Christ today. It doesn't mean I'm going to win the race if I quit tomorrow. If I fall into a snare and trap of the devil tomorrow. If I leave the will of God tomorrow. The four souls I won to Christ today, well, praise God, they'll be in heaven but I don't win the race because I, I quit tomorrow. So listen, when it comes to the race of life, continuing the race all the way to the end is more important than any accomplishment in the presence. You need, in the present, you need uh, to run your race in life with patience if you're gonna win the Christian life. So I've said number one, sit up straight. We're gonna review and we'll be done. Patience is a cheerful endurance. It means to stay under. It means to bear, to have fortitude, a steadfast waiting for. Number two, you should learn to wait patiently for the Lord to work. To give him time. Don't be impatient. Let God work everything out in his time. Number three, when producing fruit for the Lord, you need patience. It takes time to see souls saved and lives changed. But, but that's what you need, patience. Number three, when, um, number four, patiently continue in well-doing. Just keep doing well and let things fall as they may as God works them out just continue patiently continue in the well-doing number five you, you need patience in your life right so you gain patience by going through tribulations and trials when, when God says to you you need patience and you say okay Lord give me patience he says okay here comes a trial okay here comes tribulation no I want patience nope that's how you're going to get it you're never going to find patience on a, on a shelf in a store you've got to go through tribulation and trials to gain patience number six people who learn patience also retain joy man aren't you tired of being joyful and then down then joyful and then down then joyful then angry then joyful then whatever uh depressed no you want to retain joy all throughout your life? You, people who learn patience retain joy. Then, number seven, patience is needed if you wish to inherit the promises of God. And lastly, number eight, run your race in life with patience, and at the end of your life, you'll be a winner. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for those who paid attention well, who listened well. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for giving us the word of God tonight so that we can become better Christians. Lord, I don't know if there's anybody here tonight that needs to be saved, but if there, are some, if there is someone, help them to get saved. But Lord, all of us, all of us could have learned from patience, the study on patience. And whatever we needed to learn, I pray that we learned it and that we'll get it. Heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If God spoke to your heart about the subject of patience, please respond. To the Holy Spirit, let God have his way in your life tonight. Heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Shall we stand? The pianist will play.